going to take for you to see me? What's it going to take for you to not only see me, but to live in me? Or live like you believe in me? Well, the answer to that question, beloved, is a blind man. It's going to take a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus to help the disciples see. Can anybody see the irony in all of this here? No. No? Oh, Bryce, I'll tell you what irony means a little bit later. Let's not teach him that weapon, too. <laughs> Bryce right. says, let's not teach him that weapon, too. The irony that the disciples who have been following Jesus all this time still don't recognize him. And yet, a blind man calls out to the Messiah. A blind man who heard Jesus was nearby. A blind man who could not see, yet called out to the Messiah. A blind man who had not traveled with Jesus, and yet recognized the Messiah. A blind man who had only heard about Jesus. And recognized him. Son of David, have mercy on me, he cries. This is a person, beloved, who refuses to be defined by his limitations. This is a person, beloved, who refuses to be defined by his situation. This is a person, beloved, who refuses to be defined by others' expectations. This Bartimaeus, he refuses to let them silence him, and so he cries out all the louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. What's it going to take? I imagine Jesus asking us that very same question. What's it going to take for you, Loretta, to see me? What's it going to take for you, Ken, to believe in me? What's it going to take for you, Kay, to, to live like you believe in me? Because, beloved, unlike Bartimaeus, who had only heard about Jesus, we have been journeying with Jesus to Jerusalem over this past year. Think back, if you can, all the way to Advent last year when, unlike Bartimaeus, we heard John the Baptist, the prophet, preach about the coming of the Messiah. And unlike Bartimaeus, we were here at the baptism and we saw the dove come down and the Holy Spirit fall upon Jesus. And unlike Bartimaeus, we heard about Jesus' temptation in the desert and how he called those first four disciples, those fishermen, to follow him. And unlike Bartimaeus, we've been present through all the healings. We've heard how Jesus healed another blind man, how he healed a paralyzed person, how he healed a woman with the, the issue of blood. She was bleeding for 12 years on his way to the healing of Jairus' daughter, who was dead and was raised to life. This summer, we ate at the table with Jesus when he multiplied those loaves and fishes and everyone had enough. And not just enough, but an abundance. Unlike Bartimaeus, we've experienced Jesus through all of those things. Unlike Bartimaeus, We've heard Jesus predict his death not once, not twice, but three times. Unlike Bartimaeus, we've heard, we've seen, we've experienced. And yet, unlike Bartimaeus, we just don't understand. I invite you to think about all the times we've defined ourselves as a church by our situation. How many times have we said, oh, we don't have as many members as we once had? We don't have as many young people or families or kids like we 
used to have. We don't have a Sunday school for kids or a youth group. We don't have our Dorcas circle anymore. Think about all the times we've defined ourselves by our limitations. You know, we're only a small church. We don't have much money. We're too old. We're too tired. We can't do what we used to do. Think about all the times we've defined ourselves by others' expectations of what a church is supposed to be doing. You can't do that. You're a church. You shouldn't do that. You're a church. Oh my God, how can you do that? You're a church. Because, beloved, if we did understand, like Bartimaeus, We'd simply ask Jesus. We'd jump off our cloaks and we'd follow him. Jesus stands still when he hears Bartimaeus calling out to him. When he hears Bartimaeus pleading and begging for mercy. And he asks the disciples to call Bartimaeus over to him. And they do. And like I said, in answer to Jesus' call, how does Bartimaeus respond? It seems like he can't wait to get over there to Jesus. He throws off his cloak and he springs up and he goes to see what it is that Jesus wants of him. Is that our response? When our church is in need of something? Do we cry out to Jesus and ask him in faith? Yeah. Believing Jesus will answer us? Do we live like we believe Jesus will answer us? And then Jesus asks Bartimaeus that one question. What is it that you want me to do for you? As part of the United Church of Christ, we believe that God is still speaking. And I believe that God is still asking us that question. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? What is it that we've asked Jesus to do for us, beloved? I can't answer any longer than I've been here, but for the last years, we've asked Jesus for a few things. When we set up the Long Range Planning Committee, I asked them, what do you want? If money and time and talent wasn't an issue, what do you want from this church? And they said, well, we want more people. And we want to increase our finances. And we want to help others. Those were the top three. And I ask you, beloved, how do you think Jesus has responded to those questions? How has Jesus responded?
In the past three years, we've had 30 people join our church. I think what the uh, Long Range Planning actually asked for was an increase of church attendance by 10%. I think that's what they asked for. Which if we have 60 people in worship would be six people. Six people each year would be how much? My math's not so good. 18? Six times three? And wait a minute, how many did I say that have joined the church in the past three years? 30! And abundance. Imagine that. What about uh, welcoming children and families? How do you think uh, we're doing with that or Jesus has answered our prayer that way? Right, you go back up. I think you're being tested. Tiffany <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> said she thinks that we're being tested with theirs. Beloved, we have a Sunday school, not just for adults, but for children. And it may be small, but we still are doing good work. And we have a youth group. And we have things that we didn't have just a few short years ago. A vacation Bible school this summer that was phenomenal because we asked Jesus in faith to provide. And he did. Increase our finances. How are we doing on that one? Sally's shaking her head. What did you say, Jim? We're better than we were. We're better than we were. Yeah, we're not taking as much money out of our investments to survive like we used to. And that's because we've educated the congregation. We've told you the need. We've prayed about it and prayed about it, and you've stepped up. And God has provided. It's something to dance about saying thank you for that <laughs> illustration. <laughs> oh, dear. Church is 
started to hear about this. And they started to do something. And before you know it, our conference had more than enough money because that's the way that God provides when we step out in faith. We know that there's a huge drug problem here in Latrobe. And so often when we hear of problems, we're tempted to just wring our hands and say, oh, and I'm just one person. What can I do about it? Yeah, you're just one person. But with all of us persons together, we can make a difference in this world. Do we live like we believe that? Do we live like we believe that? Everything that we've asked for, we've been given by Jesus and given in abundance. And not just because Jesus simply handed it to us, but like Jim said, because we've gone out there and in the hands and feet of Christ. We put ourselves out there in faith, knowing that what we ask for will be provided. And that's an amazing thing. It's certainly something to celebrate. Like I said earlier, we have so many talents, so many gifts. Some of you are doctors. Some of you are lawyers. Some of you are bakers. Some of you are teachers. Some of you are builders. What is it that God is calling us to accomplish as a church when we put all those talents together? Because, beloved, it's only going to take a little bit of faith. It's only going to take a little bit of hope. But it's going to take a lot of love. 